like while we are talking, there is a hacker somewhere exploiting a feature that is now a vulnerability. And that to me is Log4j from a broad perspective, which is, it's just, you know, you have a lot of code, uh, statistically, the more code, the more vulnerabilities, and people will exploit that. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative, in conjunction with Cyber Reason, is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC. So, Benny, thanks, thanks for joining me. Um, I think the, the big topic on everyone's mind and the gift that keeps on giving these days is log for j uh, as, as a chief security officer. Uh, I remember that day well and the subsequent work and questions and inspections and tests. Uh, but maybe a good place to start is, is, in your opinion, what really was Log4j and, and what is it? So yeah, these are like two interesting questions. One is like tactically what it is and then uh, strategically what that is. And it's not just about Log4j, but uh, tactically Log4j is basically an open source library to for logging used by Java applications. And the vulnerability there, which is actually a feature, but then again, many vulnerabilities are, some features gone wrong, um, is the fact that you can, s when the logger, the log4j logger wants to log something, it also has the capability of actually going uh, to a server and grab a library or another module plug it in and run it. And basically, if you, let's say you go to Facebook and you put a comment and in that comment, you, you put a string that has a specific meaning for the log4j library and you put it, let's say the Facebook module, every comment is logged, then just by post, posting a comment, if you know Facebook is putting that in a log, that string will go into the logger, the logger will say, hey, that's actually a command, like I'm going to potentially log that, but that's actually a command to go ahead and fetch a module and execute it. And that's basically log4j. It's a feature gone wrong and that allowed somebody to, if they know a specific application uh, has log4j, then they can send an input to that application. And if that's logged, the log4j will go ahead to a server using some Java methodology, import that uh, code and execute. And that's log4j in a nutshell. That's tactically. Strategically, if I look back just in the last few years, but it, it spans even more, it, it, it's exactly that. That's a feature gone wrong and now you have a vulnerability. And I think cybersecurity is all about you know, managing risk, obviously. I know I don't need to tell you that as a CISO, but no, no, but but you're right. At the end of the day, we got to be reminded of it. Yeah, I agree. And every new log 4J or zero day or vulnerability that was, or, you know, it was discovered by the folks at log 4J. I think end of November, only like ten days later, it was announced. And just imagine how many years that existed. Mm -hmm. And but then I'm I'm betting exploited many, many times and nobody knew about it. Um, and that exists today. Like while we are talking, there is a hacker somewhere exploiting a feature that is now a vulnerability. And that to me is Log4j from a broad perspective, which is, it's just, you know, you have a lot of code. Uh, statistically, the more code, the more vulnerabilities, and people will exploit that. And that's actually it's probably not even a linear to do about it. Yeah, okay. it's, probably, it's probably not even a linear increase. It's probably the more complex it gets, it's like the, the surface of a sphere. As the, as the diameter increases, the, the, the surface increases more, much more quickly. You know, it's, it's arguable that these will always exist uh, to some extent. So, um, yeah, I it just, just, yeah, it's just like supply chain attacks. Uh, everyone says, oh my goodness, we've got a sunburst, we've got a hafnium. And my sense is these exist everywhere in multiple places, but for being publicly known about. So 
Yeah, I mean, well, let, before we shift into trends, why don't what do you think Canon should be specifically done about it? What, you know, if someone's sitting out there, let's say, let's take a few roles. You're 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 a CISO, um, maybe you're a C level executive. Um, how should people be thinking about this? I know we maybe tactically and strategically again. So tactically, there was actually a very easy, I don't know if it's the easy is the word here, but you can actually disable that configuration in Log4j. And that's mm -hmm. it. It doesn't do that. That feature is then disabled. Obviously, if your application relies on the Log4j capability to do that for some reason, then that's not good, potentially. Uh, but that's a quick fix. Then after that, you had like three like uh, hot fixes or like patches, which by the way, each one broke something else. And yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, pretty nasty. And uh, so that's also no bueno, although the last one, I think, was better than all of the rest. So that's a good one. But again, just disabling that configuration, because the logger potentially in most cases should not be doing that. Just disabling that configuration and you're set, you're, you're okay. And then that, that's tactically. And again, strategically, which is also tactically for Log4j, why would a logger module be communicating with anything mm -hmm. other than that the file it needs to log? It should not. Uh, that that was my frustration, by the way. On the day it happened, I said, why is it even doing that? Like, this is silly functionality. Um, but please continue, though. So what I'm saying, and you know, it's part of the logo here. It's the network part, I guess. Is oh, for those who can't who can't see, he has a shirt on that. Benny here has a shirt on that says zero networks. So, so yeah, please continue. Yeah, thank you. So basically, you should always operate in this least privileged networking mode, mm. where how you know you shall not communicate with anything unless you need to, and. You know, most backend services, especially like a logger, should not communicate with anything, period. Mm -hmm. And if you just put the control in place to make sure that cannot communicate outwards with anything, then you're also fine. It doesn't matter if an attacker, you know, going back to Facebook, if the Facebook logger, uh, log4j module cannot communicate with anything, people can comment all day long with all these strings that invoke it to do something, it will just silently you know, die and not do that, and, and that's fine. Uh, so, and, and that's the strategic thing, because again, going back to strategic point number one, where log4j is just an instance, and that's always happening. Mm. And as you said, that's gonna be exponentially growing uh, and is going, then the next logs4j or the next hashtag feature that's now a vulnerability will not happen because for the most part, most of these need a network connectivity, either inbound to move laterally, or outbound to do something, you know, to a C2 server or to fetch something. So all of that can be prevented if you operate in that sense. <coughs> yeah. So, so the, you know, the, the, you're the CEO of a company called Zero Networks. Uh, zero trust is a word that always sort of gets under my skin a little bit because, well, there's a few reasons. But number <laughs> one, most CIOs would despise having everything turned off. Uh, it's a way of, of, of just saying, hey, your job's going to get harder. But it's also a big thing to truly get really close to zero trust. Uh, you mentioned least. The word least is one of my favorite words, right? Least trust. It's like, if I can reduce the complexity of this expanding sphere, then I have a much smaller surface area to deal with. Is, is, that, is that part of what you're suggesting here? That, that we have a, a, by doing least function and least privilege and least trust in an environment, we get to a more manageable topography. Yes. First of all, I want to mention that I don't like that word zero trust because it's so overly used, misused. Mm -hmm. You know, like everybody, it means something different for, it's like, I don't like it. And by the way, in the truest check technicalities of what it means, it means that point A cannot communicate with point B unless it has some strong authentication, usually let's say MFA against third party. And then only when the third party approves, the third party says, okay, point B, the target, please open the port for point A, and then you shall communicate for a period of and, time. And actually, no entitlement. It doesn't even exist until it's exactly. asked for. And even with the third party, that trust relationship's not there. And then it's continually monitored, whatever that means, and then it's destroyed. And then somehow it's mysteriously logged in a secure way. 
et cetera, et cetera, right? It's never really well, zero. It's like a limit in calculus, really. Yeah, although the last part you said, continuously monitored, whatever that means, that's actually, it implies like the thoughts in the industry where people don't really know what that means and people use that sometimes a bit cynically, but... <laughs> Well, I mean, even humans don't continuously monitor. Even our eyes have saccade motion that jumps around, right? It's this notion that you could just stare at an object and mysteriously, the moment it blinks, you would notice that, that that's not even how, how humans actually observe things. So I get a little iffy. I know the government has defined it as once an hour, but that's not really continuous either. I agree. And there are, my point to that is that there's almost no vendors really doing that and yet self-proclaiming they are the best at doing zero trust. That's my just rant for a minute, then I'll go <laughs> back to your question, uh, which is in, that's instead of using that word, that's why I wanted to use the word least privilege because as the ball gets increased and the vulnerabilities become larger and larger and the attack surface becomes bigger and bigger, if you operate with the control that allows you to do this privilege. And that can be for the network, that can be for identity, that can be for data. And there are companies that do, that mm -hmm. excel at these things, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you, you have the next log 4 j because you operated in a model which allows you for, to have the resilience to not care. You can really sleep better because nothing will, well, it's all about probability and risk and chances, but you're in a, you, you basically are in, you, you improved your chances to fight this or to yeah. just stand a, ch a better chance to not be impacted by orders of magnitude mm -hmm. if you have those controls in place that you do true least privilege in the network, identity, and data. Yeah, yeah I mean, our job isn't ever to absolutely secure. It's just silliness, but it is to get it to an acceptable yeah. level. And this is one of the best strategies to do it. Are, are there other strategies you think, um, look, we're going to have log4j and then there's going to be something else and something else. And it feels to some extent like it's accelerating, which may just be the indicators uh, are even just a touch of that, that, that actually there's a lot more being exploited. Um, how, how do we prepare for that ongoing sequence of things we know is coming in your opinion? And is there something more uh, that we should be doing collectively or um, with our supply chains and things like that? Yeah, that's, that's even a bigger question. I know, I know. And you can scope it down if you want. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm always thinking very pragmatically. Mm -hmm. So that's a very big question. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm compiling that. Okay, what are the, you know, the bits and pieces that you want to answer to that big, bigger question, broad scope question. To me, it's all about having some of the layers in place to help you with that. The, again, the complexity will rise, the risk will rise. Like we'll always like, yeah, it's accelerating. If you look 10 years ago, it was, you know, it's there, but not like if you zoom now to now, it's like the amount of things are, that are happening and this is a testimony to what you said about the bubble increasing. That's like, you know, in math, that's squared of the number. So that that's increases there for sure. And actually an evidence, another evidence is that cyber insurance mm. lost tons of money and they are now not, not insuring companies unless they have, you know, X, Y, Z. X being, I think, EDR, right? That's like the bread and butter for cyber resilience for to be able to detect maybe mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. many times you will not detect and then somewhat of a response you know use cases and even that's how so that's like that then you have mfa everywhere if you can truly mfa everything that's the identity piece of this privilege i guess to some degree also good but the problem with mfa <coughs> i apologize for coughing oh that's okay we all have it right now yeah, recuperating from something. Um, so MFA everywhere sounds nice, but that truly exists only in cloud applications where it mm -hmm. was invented really and doesn't exist for anything on-prem almost and or, and or YAS and PaaS. So other mm -hmm. things that are not SaaS applications, but you know VMs in the cloud and some components in the cloud. 
That doesn't seem but it's also strong authorization that's needed. But I'm with you. I don't want to derail you too much. So if you get MFA in place, then where does that go? Again, that's part of the layers, right? You have yeah. like a strong EDR to help for security operations. You want some orchestration in place to help with that. You want identity protected to some degree with MFA. And uh, there is a lot of challenges there to do that correctly across the board, not just for your you know, G Suite or Office 365, but to everything an organization owns, which is a lot more than just you know, some cloud stuff. It's a lot broader than that. And then you want you know, potentially code risk management and vulnerability management. Mm. And you would want you know, maybe some network detection. You would want list privileges for networking. So there are a, company, a few companies doing that, us included, because my line of thinking here is that we're fighting symptoms and not addressing the root cause. Mm-hmm. And there are key pieces in that root cause, like an attacker will always be there. Like there will always be the next log for j The attacker will always be there. And then how do you stop them? That's the question. MFA yeah. is a key part of that. You know, least privileged networking is a key part of that because then they cannot communicate. And that's it. The, the, the basic thing that they want to do, which is to move or to communicate, to deliver something or to do something is gone. So those are some of the key pieces, I think, strategically, strategically to look at. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it's, um, I, I read uh, Sapiens years ago, um, and it, it, it had this notion of first order and second order chaos, right? First order chaos are, are complicated systems that are natural where there's adaptation. But second order chaos system is humans are in the system, usually, or other forms of intelligence, maybe one day. They're intelligently adaptive. And, and so if you're dealing with a first order chaos system, you're always reducing risk, you're fighting nature and entropy, and you can get to the five nines. But in a second order chaos system, not only are not, not only is there perhaps intelligent behavior among the good, right? We're, we're learning to connect in new ways, but the opponent is intelligently adapting. It's like if, if COVID-19 was a second order chaos, it would say, hey, I'm going through an airport, I should lower my host's body temperature. And, and I think you, you mentioned earlier, it's a risk thing and, and insurance, which, which fascinates me. It's super hard to do insurance for second order chaos. It's also the, the, the C-level of most organizations and, and the boards look at, look at companies and they go, hey, this should be like IT. Why can't you get to five nines? Why can't I just have something you put in a rack and turn on? And I think it's because we have moving targets here, right? So the, there will always be a log for j So it's not about the control you do right now. It's getting to this root cause that you've mentioned. And it's, it's almost living security. It's almost like other places in the business that deal with humans are, are human intelligence is legal and sales. We're more like that for risk than we are like whether or not the email server is working in some ways. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned that. So the boards are like, I, I like what you just said. Why can't these be like IT? Well, you put some money in and you have four, five, mm-hmm. nine, right? Like it's very predictable. Well, there are two thoughts here. One, with IT, you just, you know, you're fighting. You're not really fighting, but the, the opponent on that side is just machines. That's all you need. Okay, this is how I structure it. You, you put money, you put some technology and processes. That's it. Now you have a structure of IT. That's five nines and it's all good. Great. But in security, you have people yeah. who are super innovative and smart and can do a bunch of a bunch of you know stuff that are chaotic, as you mentioned, second degree chaos. I like that. And so you cannot just put money, let's do that, because then somebody will find something around that because they're mm-hmm. very, very, very creative. And another thing I want to mention of that, that's funny. If the boards really want five nines from security, guess what? <laughs> they, you can get it, but everybody, for everything that they do, yeah, ha, you, you have to MFA for everything. There is no more single sign-on. Like every bit of piece that enables productivity and ease of use, you have to remove, you have to secure, and then you will have five nines in security. <laughs> I would, I'd go further. If you want, if you want 100%, it so. turn it off. Just turn it off. Right? Why are we here? Right? And that, I think, brings no, us back to so, some risk is worth it. Right. So I'm not saying I'm not that extreme. No, I know. I'm not joking. Off, but, but if you truly have, if you just think of classical lateral movement from 
2010, 2012, 2014 that accelerated the UEBA market, that's based on single sign-on. Single sign-on means for some, uh, or, you know, for the audience who don't know, like when you log on to a machine and maybe then you do something, you go to a file server or a web server, you do some stuff and it doesn't ask for your user and password all the time. It just, it's hashed somewhere depending on the application and then it re, it's reusing that ticket or hash to give you the access. So the fact that that hash exists, that's something for that other to grab and move. If you don't have that and you have to put the user and password every time, just as an example, that's an attack vector that doesn't exist. And guess what? If you use the user and password and every time you have to MFA, guess what? Now even stealing your password or brute force in that doesn't exist. So there are ways where you can get to the five nines, but that's usually on the expense of productivity. Mm. I'm actually proud to say that in zero networks, we have a, a way of getting to that security level without compromising too much, mostly on productivity. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's a different discussion, but yeah. And I, and I, and I do want to hear more about that. I, we're, we're approaching the end of our time, but you just reminded me in mainframe days, there was single sign-on on mainframe. Even mainframe users don't often realize that every command required a password, even if it wasn't MFA. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, and, and, and it, there's, actually, it, there's actually code added to the mainframe to do that that people just take for granted is always present. Um, I used to be a, the product manager, among other things, at CA for the security product suite. So they had that in those days, which is Broadcom now. Um, yeah, uh, the position of your mouse has changed. You must reboot for this change to take effect. Was the uh, the old joke in the in the in the WYSIWYG world? So yeah, now this is super useful, and and I hope I hope people um, I hope people have got a bit more insight because Log4j is the tip of the vulnerability iceberg in many ways, and I think iceberg's probably wrong because it's more than ninety percent is below the waterline. Um, yeah. And that triggers into everything else in this, this complex system we call security. Um, and any final words, Benny, that, that you think would be useful to listeners? Uh, uh, and I really appreciate the time today. Well, I think you nailed it when you said, uh, again, using that tip of the iceberg analogy, this is yet an instance, and there are many more that we don't know of and many more to come. And I think strong controls in place is the key to fight whatever comes next. And that's what people should focus on. Thanks for being with me today, Benny. I, I appreciate it. And um, Log4j has not been fun, but this conversation has. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Cyber Reason is the champion for today's defenders, providing an endpoint security platform to prevent, detect, and respond to malicious operations on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Cyber Reason. End cyber attacks from endpoints to the enterprise to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash CISO stories.